And so today I'd like to introduce Rebecca Theobald, who I've had the pleasure of working and collaborating with for um, probably around 10 years now in various projects. Uh, Rebecca is an assistant professor in geography and environmental sciences at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. She directs geocivics, asking geographic questions to address redistricting and emphasizing the role geospatial technology plays in drawing electoral districts. From 2008 to 2018, she served as coordinator of the Colorado Geographic Alliance, part of the National Geographic's Network of Alliances for Geographic Education, providing, providing professional development for teachers across the state. It was through that and related initiatives that our department got a, a hold of a giant map, which I'm looking forward to uh, putting to use. She is the editor of the National Council for Geographic Education's journal, The Geography Teacher earned uh, doctoral and master's degrees from the University of Colorado at Boulder and a bachelor degree in political science from Middlebury College, Vermont. And we have two additional speakers today. Um, Stephen Geisbert is, who I, I hope many of you know, is in his final semester of the Master of Arts in Applied Geography and Geospatial Sciences program here and is on an internship with the Denver City Council working on redistricting, which is obviously going to be an important part of his uh, presentation today. Clay Adams Berger, fewer of you may know because he graduated uh, last, was spring. It? last spring. So he's an alumnus MA from our program. Um, currently working as a student contractor for the US Geological Survey, as well as interning for the city of Denver on this project. Thank you all so much for coming all the way from Colorado Springs and for presenting to us, and I'm going to turn it over to our speakers now. Thank you. I'm really delighted to be here. I, I appreciate the opportunity always to talk about redistricting. Are there any political scientists in the room? Yes, excellent. Okay. Uh, mathematicians? Sociologists? Any other disciplines? You know, really, we need everybody to ask uh, questions about the redistricting process. So about five years ago, I determined that if there was any hope for injecting a less partisan approach into the redistricting conversation, that geographers needed to be central. And the group of electoral geographers is really relatively small. Another challenge is that most people uh, considering geographically related issues remain unfamiliar with spatial concepts and with analytical aspects of tools such as a geographic information system, although they use online maps nearly every day. The focus of this discussion will be how geography is threaded through redistricting. A random review of books about redistricting found that they can contain no or very few maps. Just an aside to say how pleasant it is to be able to look through books on the library shelves again. You, you find kind of unexpected items like this pamphlet on uh, malapportionment from 1967. Um, and what these books do have is a great many charts and tables of interest to academic analysts. However, note that they do put maps on their covers. So places are what people across the country are interested in, as evidenced by many of the observations submitted online by Coloradans during the comment period this past spring and summer. The court states that the commissions compiled, complied with the obligation set forth in amendments Y and Z, which were passed in 2018 to eliminate partisan politics from the redistricting process and to provide transparency. The justices wrote, our review is a limited one. It is not our task to determine whether other plans could have been adopted, nor is it our role to decide whether we might have adopted different plans were we acting in the first instance. In its opinion on the constitutionality of the new state house and state senate districts, the Colorado Supreme Court referenced the mathematicians hired by the Independent Legislative Redistricting Commission to analyze whether out of two million possible redistricting plans, the commission's plan was reasonable. This seemed to be something they really wanted to, to emphasize, but they skipped the geographer who had provided background on measures of competitiveness. Geographic principles are often overlooked or more charitably assumed. Phil Gershmal offers a wide variety of approaches to spatial thinking, asking leading questions that apply directly when thinking about grouping people together for the purpose of re representation. 
So while these concepts inform approaches to redistricting, they are mostly not useful for public discussion until more people are familiar and comfortable with geographic concepts. I'm going to read a couple comments uh, that had come into the redistricting commissions and just think about where they might fit in terms of these concepts. Right. So is, these are all quotes. It is very important that the route County State Congressional District stays with Eagle County. The two counties are similar in geography, demographics, and values. And an individual said, I respectfully ask the commission staff to prioritize city municipality boundaries over county lines in the creation of state senate and state house districts. Aurora is a great example of what has happened in the past when counties instead of cities are prioritized. Aurora as a city spans three counties the current state senate and state house districts result in some rather unique districts that may not serve its citizens to the fullest extent possible. So here we could think about hierarchy, right? How do all these uh, districts relate to each other? Um, another person said, I'd like to see a map that acknowledges the fact that northern Colorado has its own issues and community concerns. And so here's talking about a region and um, citizens in uh, Lake County um, say, I, I urge you to keep Summit County with Lake County. Running between Summit and Lake County is a new is a bus route called the Lake County Link that provides critical transportation to both tourists and locals alike. So here we're thinking about movement, right? So people who are uh, describing the needs of their communities are addressing these geographic concepts, but they're not necessarily applying them uh, to their actual lived experience. So were the Colorado Independent Redistricting Commissions completely free from politics? To see the importance of incumbents, I invite you to compare the congressional maps from 2011 uh, with the one uh, from 2021. No congressional incumbent is particularly unhappy, suggesting that what overshadows all the guidelines presented in amendments Y and Z continues to be political power. However, I keep hoping for reasonable discourse. In an email exchange with Susan Davis, National Public Radio political correspondent in May 2021, I expressed frustration that reporters often cover redistricting from only a political perspective. She responded, what I would say is we live in a world of complexities. You are, of course, correct that in an ideal world, the only metric for redistricting should be fairness. But in a political world, it's just not that simple. With the House majority so narrow and so much at stake in the places where redistricting still has a partisan role, there's going to be some serious political battles, court fights, etc. And understanding the political motivations, I think, is just as important as understanding why the process itself matters. I like to think we could do both. Question mark, she says. Unfortunately, I am not sure that has come to pass. These examples from the many created on Dave's redistricting app illustrate five of the possible maps meeting redistricting criteria. It is these types of maps and the discussion about the pros and cons of these choices that I find particularly absent in redistricting conversations across the United States. Is it that we have not sufficiently prepared those individuals who go through the school system or sit in our classrooms to consider geographic concepts? Possibly, but that is only part of the challenge. Teachers of geography can consider ways to engage students and community members in applying geographic concepts and skills, not only with electoral redistricting, but in the context of many other current issues, from climate change to economic investment. So no matter when people show up in our uh, discussions about, uh, you know, in our political or human geography classrooms, we really need to prepare them for understanding the electoral process. Most students in the United States must take a civics or government class in secondary school, even though we would like uh, to require geography, that's unlikely. And redistricting becomes a way to thread geospatial technology into their education. Geocivics offers a suite of resources from activities describing population distribution to prioritizing redistricting criteria to drawing maps all interactive and suitable for introductory higher education or secondary school courses. 
I have used the materials both in an introductory class and in a higher level course with different expectations for mastering the concepts and skills. The inclusion of GIS does require social studies teachers to be exposed to geographic information technology during their teacher training, something that could be useful in many areas of instruction. So just for a quick review, we start with the census, which has implications for representation. You might consider having students fill out the most recent census form. And of course, there's also, um, uh, the results also affect funding in communities. And it's instructive to look at the maps that describe which states are more dependent on federal funding. But of course, what most people think about is apportionment or reapportionment. Here in Colorado, our increased population over the last decade in relation to changes in population in other states meant that we now have one more seat in the House of Representatives and one more vote in the Electoral College. But numbers can be pretty boring, so consider using National Geographic's giant map in your class to illustrate population change over time, or any number of geographic concepts, from transitions in the physical environment to distribution of water throughout the state. You could also uh, use paper maps and Legos. I've found that there are great advantages to kinetic learning, especially after so much screen time in the past few years. So now that you've got uh, census data in hand, it is time to draw new lines. Even in states that have not gained or lost a seat, there is internal migration and district lines need to be redrawn based on criteria. Remember that the product of redistricting is ultimately a map. And here we can think about uh, the change in population largely moving from rural to urban areas, not just in Colorado, but really across the country. Beyond the data, the most important part of the process is understanding and implementing the redistricting criteria. Some states have clear instructions, others are vague. I encourage you to read Colorado's list, paying attention to the order. To understand the redistricting criteria, uh, students can discuss the definitions and organize them in order of importance to them. The flashes of inside activity can be used either in person or through an online game platform. Note that party advantage is one of the options down there in the right hand corner. Although the members might not admit it, that criterion could, would be number one for many redistricting commissions. Another aspect of redistricting involves hearing from local communities. So for some states, communities of interest can be part of the official discussion about where to draw lines. Steve and Clay will be talking more extensively about this later. In addition to encouraging more engagement with spatial thinking, geographers have an obligation to remind people who engage with maps, that would be everyone, that maps always have a perspective or bias or intention. Many times when discussing redistricting, people will treat maps as neutral fonts of information. But we know that how you decide to illustrate information can significantly affect how you interpret and use a map. We recognize that not everyone is ready to be a cartographer. GeoCivics has created exercise in ArcGIS Online to introduce online mapping tools to divide states into two by county as an initial task. This works better in some states than in others, but the lesson does offer an entry point into the process. One of the most exciting aspects of redistricting in 2021 is the number of open source tools that have been created and are being supported by organizations across the country. Naively, I thought that access to these tools would lead to better discussions. While that has not been evident, I do see people across the country taking an interest in the process and proposing a variety of approaches. Here is a sample of one of the open source online tools that you could use to draw your own maps. Note that about a third of the area of Colorado has been included in a district and is still 320,000 people short of comprising a complete congressional district. Is it possible to make the construction of maps more of a dialogue? Again, here are some examples from Dave's redistricting app. Looking at these types of options, all meeting basic criteria, should have produced opportunities for debate about what a community wants to see in its district. Unfortunately, the discussions are usually comparisons of reasonable approaches to extreme partisan maps rather than dialogues about the merits of competitiveness versus keeping school district, 
or college campuses from being split. The next step after making maps is to analyze and evaluate proposed maps. Of course, the best preparation for that is to work at drawing districts. Generally, we need more people in the community with skills to assess and interpret maps of all sorts. Our role as educators is to prepare our students to have discussions, to read the popular press, to learn about issues to make informed decisions in their communities. We acknowledge they are not going to become an expert on every topic, but they need to be prepared to figure out where to obtain more information about a variety of subjects. Community members are expected, are invited, and may wish to comment on various concerns. They should do so after learning about different aspects of the issue. These comments from students indicate a greater appreciation for the process of redistricting. I would like for community members to be prepared to question the map makers, to ask them about their objectives for representation, and to have a reasoned discussion about the merits of creating a majority minority district that crosses county boundaries, or maintaining political subdivisions as a proxy for a different community of interest. The foundation of decisions about where to draw lines is in prioritizing the criteria. This should be where the fundamental discussion should originate. That was the impetus for my earlier communication with the political reporter. Yet, as we see from this note about Virginia, the people in charge have a hard time coming together. Incumbents and partisanship end up taking priority. Decisions by people in power lead to increasing frustration on the part of good governance groups. Note how many times FAIR appears in the names of these organizations. While there is dispute about what constitutes a fair map, there is agreement about when the process is not transparent. We acknowledge the efforts of legal scholars, political scientists, mathematicians, geographers, who need to define and analyze proposed and approved maps using various metrics. How can geographers participate in the conversation? Many resources are available to support your own exploration or to guide you in creating a unit on this topic for your students. Steve and Clay will provide some examples. Hey everyone, I'm Steve. Um, since last summer, uh, Clay and I have been interning with the Denver City Council, working on the redistricting process for the city districts, right? So it kind of goes in order. The uh, state and congressional districts were already drawn, like uh, Dr. Fiewald showed you, and now the city's drawing theirs. Uh, it'll be done in the spring. So we've been helping them with that process. Um, one of our primary tasks has been to uh, process and analyze community of interest submissions and testimony from, uh, from Denver residents. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So how are COIs incorporated into the redistricting process? The Denver City Council redistricting resolution binds them to endeavor to preserve logical communities of interest. So they have to do their best to try not to split these up, right? What even are COIs? Um, the Colorado Constitution, every state kind of defines it differently if they do it all. But the Colorado Constitution uh, defines a COI as any group that shares one or more substantial interests that may be the subject of legislative action. So, um, New to this redistricting cycle, and this is done every 10 years, right? So every 10 years, is all kinds of, there's new technology and new processes and learning lessons from the last cycle. New to this redistricting cycle are um, public-facing, uh, user-friendly portals for uh, crowdsourcing COIs from residents. Uh, Representable.org is the tool that Denver used this cycle. Uh, and this is an example of uh, what Rebecca was saying, uh, Dr. Fiebel was saying, uh, where many groups have uh, created tools out of frustration in response to um, frustration and lack of transparency in past redistricting cycles. Uh, so using representable uh, residents can uh, draw their perceived C, uh, COI using census groups or block groups in the example on the right in uh, shaded uh, blue. That's, that was just me messing around with it and that's what it looks like. Uh, and then answering a series of questions to give kind of qualitative information about what interests their, their uh, community shares. And the questions fall under categories uh, listed on the left. Uh, community activities and services, cultural and historical interests, economic environmental interests and uh, community needs and concerns. 
this is just to give you an idea of like one particular COI submission. You don't have to read all that, um, but this is like they, many of them come with such like robust, awesome information that we all have to like sift through and, and categorize, right? And uh, this is in East Colfax, the East Colfax neighborhood in East Denver. Uh, and what is interesting about a lot of this particular neighborhood and the COI is that it's split between uh, two districts. The districts are uh, boundaried in dark blue. Uh, and that's a problem, right? We're trying not to split these districts up. So the more, the more that we get uh, feedback on, hey, my district is split, the more that um, council members need to take that in, into consideration. Right? And their, their answers about what interests they share um, talked about cultural diversity, lack of public services, like a library, rec centers, early childhood education, uh, significant poverty in the area, and uh, the desire to unite the neighborhood into one council district. So in the past, COI success uh, in redistricting has been, um, has more come from concerted efforts by private organizations representing a particular community, not this like whole you know, crowdsource way that we're doing it now. And the best example I like to use is the last redistricting cycle in 2012 in New York City, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund, or ALDEF, um, represented the Asian American community who's um, historically been underrepresented in New York City and uh, organized them all and uh, got all of their information on how they see their particular community and what interests they share and then took that comprehensive COI and challenged the drawn congressional districts uh, by New York that cycle in the court system and won and forced New York to redraw their district boundaries. And, uh, and that resulted in the first Asian American representation in Congress. I think her name is Grace Meng. And uh, I thought when I heard that, that was so like motivating, like, wow, this is really cool that we're the point people on this thing that can be so powerful. Uh, and so that's kind of been a motivating thing through this whole process. So one of our main questions because of that is how do we bridge that gap between that proven power of these group created COIs and this like crowdsource COI thing that's, that's new and, and exciting, but we don't really know how powerful it is. Yeah, as a side note, this whole COI concept, it's young and developing and nothing says that one single individual COI is not powerful uh, or is any less powerful than these group COIs. Um, this was our own idea of what may be required uh, and this redistricting cycle, I think, is going to define more clearly um, just what kind of power these have. So as of October 31st, the COI count in Denver was 122. The mapping drive ended two days ago. I'm still processing the last of them, but we're at 154. It sounds low. It's actually a lot um, compared to any other city and county I've looked at across the country. I haven't seen anywhere near that. Uh, some states have more, but many have less. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot, actually. and. Uh, in the bottom right, that's the 11 districts of, of Denver right now. And then the larger map is, it's just those 122 COIs overlaid on top of that. There's no color scheme to it, it's random. And it really shows you just how unique everybody sees their community, right? And there's, of course, unique qualitative information accompanying each one of those. And it's a big mess, right? You can't make, you can't make sense of that. The city council can't look at that and try to endeavor to preserve that. It's too much, right? It's, you know, can't digest that. So how, how do we, our task was really turning that into something that they could they could digest and find useful. And so we started with um, a threshold of any two or more COIs with shared geography and common interests, right? And this is what we ended up with. This is the first, actually the final 14 CO, group COI areas, right? Um, some of these are already split by council district, district boundaries, uh, which is, is especially important. And then here, I'll just talk, look at two examples right now, two of our bigger examples. Um, on the left is the West Denver Group COI area. 15 individual COIs went into it. The yellow area is what, what is shared, and the blue areas are not what are, what are shared by every uh, input COI. Uh, and what's unique to the West Denver COI uh, is that um, there's a significant Latinx community that was mentioned in all of them. Gentrification, displacement, lack of affordable housing along the West Colfax corridor, uh, traffic and public transit issues and homelessness. Uh, the Athmore Park area talked about concerns about park safety issues and waste. Uh, and just for reference on each of these maps, you can see the, the Auraria campus where we're at now. Um, it's in the top in the middle, just at the bottom left of District 9 uh, in the left map. And then on the right map, uh, it's at the bottom left of uh, that right map is our North Denver group COI area. Five individual COIs went into that one. And uh, 
They mainly talked about uh, pollution and air quality issues related to the proximity to the highways, uh, the Purina plant, the Suncor refinery, and a Superfund site there. Uh, and then the Coal Clayton area, which are the two smaller square ones behind the yellow um, polygon. Uh, that's the Coal Clayton area. They talked. We had a few that talked about affordable housing uh, problems. So what geographic concepts are uh, relevant to COIs? To me, what stands out the most is the modifiable aerial unit problem, if you've heard of it. If you've taken spatial statistics, you've probably heard of it. If you haven't, you've probably heard of gerrymandering, I imagine. Um, and that stems from this concept. Um, the modifiable aerial unit problem is basically this idea where uh, if, you draw, if you're drawing areas to aggregate points, you can, there are many possibilities of how you can do it to end up with different results, right? So at the top left, there are three examples of four points and four areas drawn, and each one has a different result of how many points are in each area, right? At the bottom left is a sort of a basic idea of how that applies to gerrymandering, right? Um, 50 squares, uh, 20 of them are blue, 30 are, or 20 are red, 30 are blue. And the next two examples are two different ways to draw five districts to end up with very different results. And then really how it's applied are these gerrymandered districts on the right. They look ridiculous and, uh, and uh, that, is, that stems from this idea of the modifiable aerial unit problem. And how that relates to communities of interest is if the redistricting process is linked to protecting communities of interest and not splitting them, then it limits the possibilities of what people can do in the modifiable aerial unit problem, it limits the possibilities of how it can be abused. Does that make sense? If you have any questions, ask after. I'll talk more about that. Cool. All right, and uh, I'll hand off the claim. Thank you. Um, again, my name is Clay, and the piece of this study that I um, played the biggest part in was the um, city council member engagement portion. Um, essentially, the goal of this piece of our study was to talk with each of the council members um, through a couple different meetings to try to figure out how we can better assist them by essentially mapping their voice and their understanding of what's going on in each of their districts. Um, so as far as um, interacting with the council members goes, um, we had two different meetings that we are in the process of setting up with them. The first one is an initial interview um, where Steve and I have taken notes on what the council members are saying is going on in their district. Um, we converted it onto a GIS, um, turned the GIS into a map. And during the follow-up meeting with the council members, we went over what they said, or at least what we thought they said in the first meeting to um, review the data, um, figure out how we should revise and improve upon it, and also discuss with them further um, what they feel this data could be applicable to with the redistricting process. Um, so as far as um, the first interview goes, um, Steve and I sat in on interviews that our um, internship supervisor conducted with each council member individually. Um, each of these questions were open-ended um, and they each allowed the council members to um, go into detail about what they see is happening in their districts. And they all fell into one of five different topics, um, either the existing boundaries um, that their district is in, uh, the community engagement um, that is currently occurring in their district, um, current changes in the district in terms of the uh, demographics and um, development, um, the 2021 redistricting process and what their thoughts um, are of it at this point, and um, future development and areas of concern in the district. A few of the example questions we asked each council member include, what do you think about your currently mapped boundaries? Um, are there neighborhoods or areas in your district that split a community with another district? Um, since your time in office, where have the demographics changed noticeably? And are there problems or issues in your district that are unique to your district? Um, so following this interview, again, we created maps um, to present to the council members during the follow-up meeting. Um, it should be noted that this part of our study wasn't actually in our internship description. Um, Stephen and I just thought it made sense to include um, the city council members' inputs for multiple reasons. 
Um, as we are getting the uh, community of interest um, data, we realized that it just made sense to talk to each of the council members that are governing each of those districts because at the very best, it could be complementary to the data that Steve was working on, and at the very least, it could give us a different element of understanding the different dynamics and changes that are occurring within Denver. Um, outside of that, each of the council members um, can have up to eight years of experience running each district, um, so it would be silly not to talk to them uh, when they play such an integral part of what's going on within Denver. Um, the members uh, also can provide us um, a view of their district from a variety of different lenses. Um, we have a relatively diverse city council body um, that stem from different um, professional backgrounds, age groups, ethnicities, and sexual orientations. Um, so not only can we talk to people that are professionals in managing Denver, but um, we can also hear from very many different viewpoints um, what is occurring and what can be done better. Um, a couple other examples, um, one city council member has lived within Denver for over 40 years and one is a fifth generation Denver native. So, no, so not only do uh, these council members um, know the changes that are currently happening in their district, but a lot of them have for the past few decades experienced these changes firsthand. Um, so this is one of the um, very simple maps we created for each district um, uh, for the follow-up meeting. Um, it should be noted that these maps, um, their only intended purpose is uh, to talk with the council members during the follow-up meeting um, where, to ask them, you know, do we, are we mapping your voice correctly? What could be done better? Um, and a few of the examples of the data being mapped include uh, major community gathering locations, uh, portions of their district that are actively gentrifying, um, locations of the community that are currently divided between one or more districts, and areas that have been historically difficult to engage with for the council members. Um, it's our hope that at this point um, in this piece of our analysis, the council members can see how easy and clear um, it is to be able to map their perspective on what's currently happening in their district and what can be approved upon, um, and that they can use this data in tandem with the community of interest data um, to either individually or collaboratively with other city council members try to find the most fair and balanced way of remapping Denver. Um, so during the uh, follow-up meeting, we had three follow-up questions that we asked each council member at the very beginning of the meeting. Um, the first is whether or not they were accurately represented in the maps or what we should um, fix for, um, you know, uh, follow hopeful, hopefully follow-up meetings. Um, concerns they have with the upcoming redistricting process and where they see their district uh, either realistically or ideally expanding or shrinking. Um, the primary purpose of this meeting is to understand how this data can be used to benefit city council members with the redistricting process, again, either um, for themselves or in collaboration with other city council members, and having the ability to spatially uh, represent the phenomena as the council members understand it in each district can, again, maybe lead to a improved redistricting process this decade. Um, so as far as results um, for this piece of our study goes, um, we've currently uh, had a follow-up meeting with four different city council members, um, one of which was extremely excited about this piece of our analysis and has actually set up a third meeting for us um, to begin creating maps that they think would be important um, to present to other city council members. Um, we've also had several follow-up meetings that ended with the council members not really being interested in um, this piece of our project for one reason or another, and um, we're, we still have yet to hear from a few city council members, um, which was expected. Um, but we do see so much um, importance and purpose with this piece of our data, primarily how it links up with the community of interest data that Steve worked on. Um, one example is both a city council member um, talked about the gentrification west of I-25 and a community of interest in that um, area has discussed the exact same problem and the concerns they have of displacement of the residents 
west of I-25. And another example, a different city council member um, talked about how Loretto Heights um, identifies more with College Views, um, College Views neighborhood and their respective district than the district they currently reside in. And that's the exact same thing um, we read in a community of interest that Steve was um, sorting through. So this is an example of both a community of interest and a city council member talking about how the same community is being split up and their voice isn't being accurately represented, which really gives us a lot of promise for the importance of this study. Um, while the promise, while there is promise um, in this work, um, it's still unclear what the council members are going to do with this data. Um, we're still in the very early on stages of this process. Um, that being said, um, working with this data is extremely fluid and it's very easy to work on it in tandem with the other um, city council members maps we created or with the community of interest data. Um, so we're hopeful that um, we're still going to progress with this piece of our study, um, but right now it's, it's still unclear. Um, so that is our current analysis um, in its current state, and we would love to answer any questions that you uh, have about it. First of all, I just want to clarify when you, when you say you receive a community of interest, that refers to some individual kind of making the submission to a representative and saying this is my community. Correct. Yes. Uh, correct, but um, in, in actual, it, it's kind of it's kind of hard to um, get the right nomenclature for this piece of it. Um, so I feel like we kind of refer to COIs as individual submissions and a community being. Um, you know, two or more um, submissions. Um, so this is actually from two or more submissions, like what we consider to be a valid community of interest. And, and so when you say two or more submissions, what you mean is a community of interest that was submitted around the same issue. Correct. Right. They, they, share, they share space and, and interest. And, and yes. And yes. Yeah. And, I, and, and so this is kind of a uh, I know I've, I've chatted with you guys about this. Before. And I think one of the dangers, uh, and I'm just curious what your opinion about it is now. First, could you kind of tell us what the rules are for submitting such a, a COI? And, and the concern I would have is that the, the intent of this initiative is to kind of get around the hyper-partisanship that occurs where districts are very carefully constructed in favor of one party over the other. And so my, my question is, have you seen any evidence of, like in, in open source, they call them geo-vandals, right? Or are these interest groups who have kind of figured out like, okay, well this is how this is going on, so we can organize um, people to put together COIs to kind of represent. I have um, seen evidence of coordinating. Um, for example, I just processed like the last 30 this week and like four were from that East Colfax example and they all had such similar wording. Like I had, uh, only our boss has like the, the administrative access to representable where she can see um, identifying information and I don't think it's even that much identifying information. It doesn't validate it anyway, so you put whatever you want. Um, but also those, we know just from like um, specific to East Colfax, that is all accurate information that they were saying. So it wasn't like trying to be um, nefarious in any way. That was an underrepresented community trying to, you know, coordinate and be like, hey, we need help. Um, so I didn't see, I could not see any examples of a coordinated effort of something different, of something worse. But uh, that is definitely open to that happening. And I don't know how that is solvable. I don't know what they'll do with that. I'm sure it'll be 10, I have 10 years to figure it out, so. Oh. <laughs> the, the conversation has happened at the state and congressional level as well. So the, the comments, as I think it happens less on maps, particularly the newer maps, but I've got an example of somebody was filling out basically a form right? Please tell me your community. Please tell me what your agricultural project 
products are, uh, and and so please share this information. And that's not a terrible thing. I mean, there are all kinds of interest groups across the country who say, call your senator or representative, right? That's essentially what is, is happening here. And it's pretty obvious when you get that information. And so as long as the people who are assessing that know that some group is out there encouraging people to communicate, then you can see that pattern. It's, it's really pretty obvious. In, and, and that's why it's so important that this be transparent and open. And so I would think your work, right, would eventually be available to the public. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I kind of wonder if they wouldn't move to an open system where the, the people who submit are identified. That would be nice. Uh, that Representable doesn't have it. I think Esri has a product that has that. I was watching Sacramento's commission review all of theirs, and I saw like actual names on them. What was cool was actually community members could see them as soon as they were submitted and then comment on those submissions, too. I thought that was pretty awesome, but um, yeah. And, and for the state, they are named. You have to name a name and location. Not for the city. That would be cool for the city. Just be curious whether the Thomas Center made their public in November, their public as soon as they're made or after the bill? After I'm processing them now and then I'm gonna make a whole like comprehensive product and then I think that's gonna be public. Yeah. When you have multiple submissions for what we would consider a single single line, there's gonna be some spatial variations in how they draw their community, so do you use the maximum extent or do you have to like aggregate that spatial data to try to figure out what no, I, mean, I just use intersect, just intersect function. It was pretty basic, just work. Uh, yeah. Um, what kind of challenges or things have you guys noticed? It sounds like you're working with some Esri products and some open source. Is it difficult to integrate, or how do, you, how do those systems work together? Yeah, I mean, representable it gives a GeoJSON, and then that has to be converted. Uh, converted. I don't know. It's a whole painful process, honestly, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, it definitely wasn't perfectly compatible. Yeah. Are you very welcome? Yes, yeah. Yep. I have a question. Remember the open source, uh, you mentioned that you were expecting to have more participation in the last system like being open source, and yet it just happened. Can you tell us more why, what was the impact of the result of that? So, as I said earlier, it's really unfortunate that the partisan politics really overshadow everything. And so when you want to have a conversation about the various criteria, and I, I just have an illustration of, of these cards here, that, that one would prioritize. And the discussions that happened at the commissions didn't actually really fully get to those criteria until really the very end of the of the process. Because it was all kind of, yes, we want to hear from the public and we'd like their information and this is really interesting. But they didn't make the hard decisions here about whether they were going to prioritize incumbency or some of the other criteria that were available to them. And I would argue that they took the easy road at least in the congressional districts. I can't speak so much to the state House and Senate districts. And and moved things around on the map so that most every incumbent had a space that was congenial to them. As opposed to something which would have been more creative, like the proposition of the Southern District. So in Colorado, we actually did have some debate about this process. That's not happening in many other states at all. And so I'm speaking really broadly to the whole country. And there it's because the, the partisan process is so clearly entrenched that they're really, it's really very difficult to take it out of, of saying, okay, we would, like I showed those example maps from Montana and Missouri, and, and those were completely redrawn districts based on other criteria not incumbents at all. And so I think the major problem is that it's very difficult 
even in Colorado, where we are explicitly said not to favor incumbents, it's hard not to do that. So that's, we're kind of stuck. Have you ever heard your news when two words are talking in the, the direction of the representatives, what were the way you presented information? Do you think that make a difference? Or? You know, I was actually kind of wondering if it was my pitch why so many weren't as interested as I was hopeful they'd be. Um, but my internship supervisor um, sat in on these follow-up meetings, and she's a legislative policy analyst for the um, city of Denver. So she works really closely with each of the city council members. And after I did my pitch, she did an even better pitch um, after that. And um, they just still, for one reason or another, didn't have any interest in having um, their perspectives being mapped and used for the redistricting process. Um, and my guess is probably that they just already have their mind made up with how they want to go about doing the redrawing process, um, which is why we, again, still have yet to um, get responses from many of the council members. Um, so, so that's essentially my idea is they just see their way of doing it as being fine. Can I ask really quickly, could you clarify, um, it seems ultimately like this whole process is in place to come up with better information and inform better decision making. Can you just really quickly explain to us, at least from the perspective of the city of Denver, who, who decides ultimately? I mean, who, is, is it at the, does the city council take a proposal and then vote on it, or how, how does that work? You're talking about a proposed district boundary plan? Yeah, I mean, we're going through a process of redrawing districts, and somebody right. has to make the decision. Okay. I'm just curious. Okay, so they have this software called Maptitude by Caliber, right? And they're, uh, they're in the process of uh, getting a public-facing version of it. And from January, for all of January, basically, all of the public can submit their ideas of how they think the districts can be drawn. Uh, in Denver, and depending on which district you come from, I think this is how I heard them talk about it recently, um, your plan will go to your particular council member, and they will take those into consideration when drawing their plan. That's how they, because they're expecting so many of them that they thought that that was the best way to go, and everywhere is different. I mean, this is just what, like, is well-intentioned, we'll see how it goes. Like, this is how they want to handle it to make it feasible. At the end of the day, though, it's the city council who redraws and approves. Yes, at the end of the day, so it's 13 council members, right, 11 districts, two at large, and they are going to uh, each come with their own or agree on someone else's and then all vote on what is there. So there will be potentially or, or potentially 13 ma proposals. Yeah, it seems like the, the political process itself is kind of set up to favor incumbency, of course, right? Yeah, I don't disagree. And, and for the legislative and the congressional commissions, those were initially staff plans. So individuals who are nonpartisan staff were proposing maps. But again, none of those maps were what I would call creating maps. They were very much responding to the people who were currently in office. Whereas what I really like about these other mapping tools and particularly, Dave's redistricting app makes it easy that you can go online and you can look at these notable maps. I did not have to search through there to find the most competitive or the most compact or the one that splits the least municipalities. They're already doing that for you. So it's not as though this information is not available to everybody across the country. It is, but people are not looking at it in a way that's informing, again, the conversation. Maybe you really do end up with the map that favors incumbents because that makes the most sense or it seems the most fair. But to not have that conversation, I think, is the major challenge. And I, I think that's what was kind of frustrating you guys. And you're, you're like, well, we hear, is this what this map looks like to you? And does this represent your district? And if they don't really care or if they haven't thought about it in a slightly different way, then again, you're really just talking about a very narrow conversation instead of really saying, is this the best way to represent people? And that's what, that's what I'd like to at least extend the conversation. And I'm also not hearing that in the public media. 
right? There, no one is ever showing up on a, I don't watch all that much television, but my narrow television watching, no one shows these other maps. It's never out there as an option. And, and to me, that's what we're really missing in terms of dialogue. Yeah, it seems like people understand that it's a problem, but they don't have any idea of, about what to do about it, basically. Mm -hmm. I was just curious, so given the kind of what seems like the ease by which these kind of redistricting efforts can be co opted by uh, partisan uh, entities, let's say, and the complexity of the kind of perspectives that people see among, you know, within their communities, right? Or the, the, the complexities of the way in which they kind of characterize themselves, et cetera, et cetera. What's the argument against kind of taking a human hand out of this entirely and allowing kind of random uh, computer models to simply uh, satisfy the criteria that are set up in our governing laws and just allow for uh, a more random uh, objective process to kind of take care of this for us? Other than putting a lot of geographers on work. Oh, well, the, 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 in many other countries, they actually do have a much less partisan process. And so and it becomes much more um, mathematical. But math still can't address all of the geographic issues, like rivers or continental divide. Or, I mean, you could put in all kinds of parameters. But you're still going to have to have that human go in and look at the information. So the question is not so much moving completely toward math, but it's moving really away from the political and the partisan. And the independent commissions are doing that across the country in a way that hasn't been done previously. So again, Colorado was not completely devoid of politics. And you could, again, you could look at the comments that were certainly coming in from partisan perspectives, but you're going to have people from different viewpoints, whatever partisan direction you agree with, right? You might want more of them than somebody else, but, but at least all of those people were transparent and you could see the conversations that were happening. And so I think the more important piece, rather than making it mechanical, that's not the right word, but is to make it transparent so that you see how the process is actually working. Yeah, I think, I think my worry is that transparency requires an engaged public. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and maybe what we need to do more of is build into our processes the fact that the public is not engaged and to set up kind of within our processes the uh, objectivity that, that, uh, that assumes Great, great observation. This is where we get to continue our discussions. We've come to the end of our hour. I want to thank everyone again for coming and please join me. I'd like to thank the, our three speakers for a wonderful talk and discussions.